Okay, welcome to the session. Uh, we will share the mics, yes. So, so welcome to the session of um, Policy Network for Meaningful Access. That is one uh, year round work that we have started um, since the last IGF stopped uh, last year. And we are here just to make the point of what has been done over uh, these 12 months and share with you where we are. Uh, the concept of meaningful access has emerged in response to the growing body of evidence that even when people are connected, uh, then not necessarily they use it properly or they don't use uh, for their own uh, means, but they use for as consumers, while the meaningful access means that they can use as a tool for the community th to which they belong. During this uh, pilot year, um, the PNMA has built a network of experts that uh, we are calling the multi-stakeholder working group. And in providing linkages with ongoing relevant discussion in other fora, because as you know that this is a topic that is discussed in many other places. Uh, to achieve the impacts that we expect in, in 22, uh, the policy network of focused on uh, on a work plan which connects with the future framework of the new IGF as it will be defined uh, as is taking shape uh, in the rooms uh, nearby. So this session of today, we want to address the discussion and the good practices around three overarching thematic work streams. The first is connectivity that you have heard in many other fora uh, during these days. Even this morning there was one about connectivity in Africa where we have some or the speaker here that we can can talk about. Second one is digital inclusion, that for us is as much important as connectivity because it's a citizen, citizen approach. That means accessibility and multilingualism, local services and content in local languages, and we have some example here, based on local needs and resources. And then capacity development is the third pillar. Technical skills training, with the attention to the highlight goals and proposed outcomes. And on this, we have other people here as a resource people that can help. I'm Giacomo Mazzone. I'm co-chair of the policy network with uh, Sonia that is online somewhere. I cannot see her, but I'm sure that she is with us. And Daphne, mm, that is the person assisting us in this work that uh, she works too much that uh, now is sick <laughs> and today cannot be with us. L let's hope that we'll recover soon. So, uh, without losing more time, I think that uh, we can start with a video of a, a panelist that was supposed not to be with us today, so we will have a case of duplicity, but because it's a, it's a good synthesis, I would like to, to see with you. The regie can send us the video. introduce the video by yourself. As limbed himself. There is no audio. No sound. Good scene. If I'm Vice President and Chief Internet Evangelist at Google, and the recently appointed Chair of High Level Panel that will be working with the Internet Governance Forum in Addis Ababa. I'm sorry that I'm unable to join you uh, at the Policy Network for Meaningful Access to the Internet, but I did want to offer a few small thoughts that might trigger uh, more thoughts on your part. The first one is that meaningful access has to be accompanied by accountability in the online space and agency given to parties, whether that's individuals or organizations or even countries, to protect themselves in the online environment. We reached the point where it is becoming hazardous to be online. It's even hazardous to be offline if your computer has become infected. 
And we need to do something about that. There are a number of technical uh, tactics that we can apply, strong authentication, two-factor authentication, encrypted communication. The list gets longer and longer. Uh, but I think we also need to come to an agreement that making the Internet a safer place means that when we have identified parties who are uh, harming others, that, uh, that they are uh, held to account. And because the Internet is global in scope, that accountability needs to happen potentially across international borders. And that surely requires international cooperation. We have mechanisms like the uh, Mutual Legal Assistance Treaty, or MLAT, but they're known to be relatively slow moving and in an online Internet environment, slow moving is not your friend. So we need to improve the ability of uh, countries to cooperate with each other and frankly, for countries and the private sector to work together to make the Internet a safer place for everyone. That uh, really is necessary because the private sector often has more uh, invested resource in the Internet than uh, any particular government. So there are plenty of other things to occupy us during the IGF meetings coming up in Addis Ababa. But uh, in this particular case, I hope you'll also keep accountability and agency in mind as you think your way through potential remedies for improving the Internet environment. Thanks for listening. Hello, my name is Vince Cerf. I'm Vice President and Chief Internet uh, Evangelist. We, we can stop Google. because <laughs> duplicity is fine. <laughs> so can I start asking if you agree with this speaker, Mr. Cerf? Do you agree with the previous speaker? Uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> it was a joke. Don't worry. No, <laughs> Did you agree with yourself? Well, I don't, I don't really know that I have more to add to what I just said until we've had more <laughs> conversation. But I will say that, uh, that being here for the last several days, it's very clear that everyone does want a safer Internet. There's infinite incentive to want that to happen. The hard part is figuring out how to do it on a grand scale in such a way that uh, you actually achieve an effective uh, safety for everyone. And I think we're still struggling to find, uh, there's plenty of incentive, but we actually f have to figure out how to do that. So I hope by the end of this week, we will have some ideas for actually making something work. Thank you very much. So it seems that uh, the two speakers are agreeing among themselves. That's good. Uh, Roberto, that, that you are helping with the remote, is Sonia with us? Can we give the floor to Sonia for? Yes, yes, please. If we can My grant her permission to open the mic. Can yes, uh, I'm here. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me, Roberto and yes. uh, Giacomo? We can hear you, yes. Wonderful. Wonderful. Well, um, welcome all of you to our session of the Policy Network on Meaningful Access. It's really a pleasure to be here today with all of you and to see so many wonderful partners and friends joining us, not just as speakers, but also in person and online here. We have a pretty nice uh, room uh, full of uh, amazing uh, folks uh, interested in learning more here at IGF. And I would say also supporting because they are interested in our mission as a network. So thank you for giving me a few minutes. And I'm going to pass it to you, Giacomo, to do the moderation from on site. And I'll do my best here supporting uh, all of us online. Um, all of our speakers are now here, which is wonderful, including Sophie. Uh, hello, Sophie. So we are ready to um, participate from online whenever you give us the green light. Thank you and welcome everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Thank you, Sonia. So let me briefly introduce the speakers and then we go with the first one that will be Sophie because she has to leave us for other engagement. So um, there is one that I will not introduce because you already know who is. Uh, then on my left you have um, with us um, ah, this is the previous script where you were not in, so... <laughs> well, let, let me do my introduction, shall I? Yeah, please. Okay. Um, so for those of you who don't know me, uh, my name is Tegest. I'm the CEO of uh, Habesha View, which is a streaming platform uh, working with local content creators uh, at the beginning in Ethiopia and then also now Pan-African. So I've come from the private sector. Um, obviously, the internet safety um, security is very, very important to the business I'm in. 
Um, I would also like to say that I was born here, left a little while ago, so um, I'm very happy to be part of this panel, and thank you for inviting me. Okay, then we have on my right Margaret Nyambura Ndungu, and then we have Onika Makwakwa, hmm? not to be so much wrong, and then we have uh, Ponsevet, uh, and Roberto Zambrano that is with us uh, helping and supporting as usual, <laughs> as last minute volunteer every time. Uh, and then we have online um, Sophie Maddens from ITU. Can you show up? Okay, we see you, thank you. And we have Chris Ayeki. Chris? Okay, so we are all here and we can start. We have seen from Vint introduction which are the challenges that uh, we have in front. And you see that um, from this multi-stakeholder participation in the panel that this is a concern that uh, we shared um, across all the constituencies. And I think that it's good that we are at the level of um, uh, consciousness that um, it's important for all of us to ensure that the internet will be for everybody as has been reiterated by uh, Gutierrez in uh, the goals for the next uh, SDGs. Um, and the digital compact will have to deal with that and the IGF is supposed to contribute and to give in input in this sense. Uh, the, uh, as I explained to you before, the, the policy network is working identifying case studies uh, that we have collected among all the communities and thanks for those that uh, have sent. Uh, this is a work that was supposed to be closed a few weeks ago, but in reality we are continuing to discover new cases. For instance, this arrived just yesterday. Uh, it provided they are meaningful, that they, are, they could be repeated, these are always good for us and will be included in the row. Uh, this morning there was, for instance, the presentation of ICANN Initiative of Digital Africa that uh, has just been launched, was not uh, public until we, we arrived here, so we, it is important to, have, uh, to listen also from that. Um, among the cases that you will find in the report that will be published by the policy network at the end of the session, at the end of sorry, the, the IGF in the next days will be made available, you will find many cases like this. But today in the session we want to focus on some of these cases and the question for all the speakers is the first question. Um, based on the case studies or experiences that you are bringing at our attention, um, can you explain why, can you pitch why these are cases that are of interest, uh, why they can contribute to solve the problem of the meaningful access? And, um, the, and then the next question, but this will be the second round, is how this could be replicated? Because of course a case that has been made possible in Africa not necessarily could be replicated in other countries or has to be replicated in, uh, with a certain number of caveat and precaution. So I give the floor to Sophie Maddens because the ITU uh, has been um, among the biggest contributor to this exchange of ideas. Uh, and they submitted the three cases. But Sophie knows more than me, so I leave the floor to her. Welcome. Hello, Giacomo. Hello, Sonia. Hello, dear panelists. It's an honor and a pleasure to join you today, although I would have loved to be in Addis with you. Uh, we did indeed contribute our work on developing a digital mapping platform, displaying internet traffic roads to help visually identify digital infrastructure gaps and access possible solutions to bring them. We also submitted our last mile connectivity to toolkit to identify the unconnected areas and select sustainable technical, financial and regulatory so solutions for affordability and accessibility to relevant um, connectivity services, and of course our spectrum management tools and experiences, this for sustainable economic and social development, including developing computerized frequency management and monitoring systems. But as you know, and Giacomo, as you know, having participated in our global symposium for regulators, I think it is very, uh, achieving that affordable, meaningful, universal and meaningful connectivity and the sustainable digital transformation 
to make sure, as Vint Cerf said, that we have everybody online safely. I think it's important as well to look at our tools and, and, and products relating to digital regulations, so our platforms, our products. Our work continues to identify the regulatory trends and best practices for regulation through our platforms and products and services, such as the Global Symposium for Regulator, but also the Digital Regulation Handbook and Platform and Training, and of course, the data. We need evidence-based decision-making, and our data includes the ICT Regulatory Tracker, the G5 Benchmark, the Accelerator, the ICT Policy Lab, and our econometric modeling and tools. Because we all know that regulators and policymakers are facing a number of issues uh, related to the, to the themes of this panel, which I will summarize as adoption or connectivity, access and value creation. And access is really about creating the enabling environment uh, in terms of governmental, economic and technological environment for everyone and, ev for everyone and everything to connect. Also, adoption is making sure everyone is empowered to use the digital and that digital is affordable. And value creation is about enabling everyone to contribute to reap the benefits brought by a digitalized society and economy. So we really do need those strategies and tools and need them to be implementable and sustainable. And for that, it has to follow some tried and tested guiding principles that are implementable and sustainable. I've mentioned the work we've contributed as well as our work on digital regulation. Because, and let me just focus in on one particular aspect. As we are in that sustainable digital transformation, regu our regulators and policymakers, all our stakeholders, we're all adjusting ways to connect with our counterparts across economic sectors, industry, and end users. And so our practices of developing regulation and government interventions to leverage on digital transformation as an engine for sustainable de development and to reach that affordability and accessibility, we have to be agile and flexible. So we, and also we need to be collaborative, cooperative, locally grounded, comprehensive, inclusive, innovative, and open-minded. And I know in the IGF, the multi-stakeholder model is definitely one of the principles and you, we all strongly believe in. But we also need the economic and digital regulatory tools, processes, and procedures to promote that engagement of the broad and diverse range of stakeholders in those collaborative regulatory approaches across the sectors and to foster that informed, inclusive, evidence-based rulemaking and decision-making process. So that's the tools that, and, and the elements that we submitted to you, uh, in t including the mapping, the spectrum tools, the digital regulation tools, the last mile connectivity, and the costing out of what it, what it, will, what it, what it is, uh, what it costs to bring the others online. We believe that uh, rules and decisions should be based on current and granular evidence and market data. Processes and tools must be able to be adapted to create that virtuous dynamic for investment, innovation, and inclusion. And while the regulatory basics still apply and core regulatory mandates still need to be thoughtfully used, the job of regulators and policymakers requires new skills and new thinking to create that enabling environment so that we can attract investment, ensure access for all, and all of this in a safe, secured, and informed manner. I hope I will still be here for a second round because I have to jump to the study groups where I'm uh, the focal point on consumer protection and our meeting is starts in 20 minutes, but it was definitely an honor to be with you today. No, don't worry, Thank Sophie. You. Thank you very much for your contribution. Uh, until you can stay with us, please do. And if you want to take the floor, uh, Sonia and Roberto will warn me and we will give you the floor if you want to react to any of the next speakers um, discussion. Um, then, um, do we have Carlos with us? Yes, Carlos is there. Yes, yes, Giacomo, how are you? <laughs> so, Carlos, uh, just a warning before to, to give you the floor. Uh, don't look at what Sophie did, because Sophie used more minutes, because she will not be with us at the end. So, but the five minutes rules applies to you, from you onwards. Thank you. Oh, sure. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Giacomo. Thank you, Sonia. Thank you, everyone, for having made this. Uh, I mean, this opportunity for me to speak in here, but also to 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 chair the policy network on meaningful access. Uh, it's you know, it was great last year. It is great this year. 
Uh, we did submit as the Association for Progressive Communication together with our partner Rhizomatica a number of um, case studies. Uh, we do work with several partners across the global south uh, highlighting, so I'm only here amplifying their work, right? It's not actually work that I do. I just support many people that are on the ground, many organizations that are on the ground doing the, the work on their own communities. Um, and this is mainly the gist of the contribution that, that all, from all those contributions and case studies that we submitted, that there are many communities out there that, as Sophie was saying, they don't find value on the current commercial internet as we know it, right? And that they, find, they feel that their communication needs uh, is not covered by those by those by that interest by that internet right either because of the affordability because of the language because of the uh, format in which the communication is is processed because they don't find find it safe you know according to what Vin was saying right and and safe in a different way and I think that's where meaningfulness comes into in relation to how that those interests those commercial interests are actually jeopardizing or may jeopardize uh, in many cases that we are what. way uh, their language their culture so on and so forth so taking communication into their own hands allow them to rethink about alternatives that, that they don't that don't put their own ways of being and living at risk uh, one while at the same time maximizing the benefits that you know communications infrastructure bring to us all and one example that was that is highlighted in the report is janastu in in india uh, they are putting a lot of their efforts technologically wise into some sort of a locally contextualized spoken web. Uh, you can read a bit more about it in the report. Making content relevant and affordable for poor, the economically poor and illiterate people is important for this, right? Managing the, your own infrastructure allows you to exercise that type of autonomy over your communication, right? And that's where the other contributions come, come into place that, that appear in the report. It, it is the School of Community Networks that started, uh, that APC and Razomatic are putting together, it started in 2012 uh, from an exercise in Mexico with those working with communities. And, um, and they realized that the pedag pedagogical strategies that, um, that were required for communities to do this need to re be rethought and centered around the autonomy, fostering the autonomy of these, of these communities, right? And so community networks all around the world are proving this, right? And around the conditions, the second part of the first question, what are the conditions? Well, if the commercial inter internet was covering those needs, people would not have gathered, put their effort, their resources, their time into creating these alternatives, right? Into creating these complementary, way, complementary ways of using the internet. So one condition is the need, uh, and, and is proving to be a huge need in many, in many communities over the world. The other one that I want to focus on is cont contextualization. Right? Uh, in the submission from Mexico, it is acknowledged that what they did cannot be fully replicable because all the pedag pedagog pedagogical processes must be contextualized. But a methodology uh, used in the design there was created, and it, was, it is the basis for the development of other school of community networks that started last year and that we are supporting in South Africa, Brazil, Indonesia, Kenya, and Nigeria. I, I will put the link on the chat in case uh, someone yes, wants, please. wants to ask. Thank you. That's very useful. <laughs> yeah. And then just to say that one thing is contextualized across countries. The other one is contextualized within the countries. And there are these mesa organizations are chairing multi-stakeholder advisory committees to contextualize this further. But then those taking part on the schools contextualize this further to the context of their own communities, to their local context and their own needs. So. That kind of three-layer or multi-layer uh, uh, contextualization, I think, is a basic condition. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, yes, I agree with you that um, there are many interesting examples. Uh, the two that you have mentioned are quite surprising. I suggest you to read the report. For the moment, it's in draft, but, uh, um, but the cases are already there, and there are the links that are very interesting. Uh, you have mentioned, uh, Carlos, the um, community network. I think that the next speaker with us could eventually tell something about that, uh, coming from Gambia. Hello. Yeah, thank you. I think um, one of the uh, most important things um, in looking at meaningful access is how 
do you engage the right stakeholders, um, in my view? And in engaging the right stakeholders, you're talking of getting the telecom sector to be more engaged directly with the ministry of either its communication and digital economy, and in some cases, in some countries, they use the, um, the Ministry of Finances responsible for the um, universal access policy. But if, I, if I'm to contextualize it in, within, the, um, in, within the Gambia framework, whereby we have um, $5 costing um, for one gigabyte of um, mobile data, so even for the average man that um, in the village that earns um, less than a dollar a day, how is he going to emphasize on access? And the interesting thing is that the taxes are high on telcos because they are the new um, cash cows of um, paying governments a lot of taxes in a lot of African countries. And the only way to go about it is in rural communities for meaningful access to really exist is these telcos should be given a leverage, a tax leverage that you set up um, more towards in villages because most of the telco companies like in the Gambian case we tell you that how why will I set up a tel um, um, a, a tower in in a place in a village that you only have 300 people and at the same time you have a health center you have a um, you also have a primary school and maybe 10 kilometers going further you have a high school serving about 10 villages to them it's not profitable and the only way um, that that can be addressed is for telcos to be given these tax leverages and then communities can come together with civil society like what we are trying to do in, with Joko Labs Banjo and work in setting up community centers knowing that the cost will come down. I, th I think that, um, th that will be a model that will work because a lot of countries they have the cable in, in, in the case of the Gambia, we're getting a second submarine cable. We had only one through the African Coast to Europe submarine cable, but getting the cable is not just enough because at the end of the day, most people, even though broadband access is coming to take it to the last mile, is becoming expensive, and most people depend on mobile data. And that is why we have to have, I like what um, Sophia said about really making the multi-stakeholder um, process which the IGF is all about to to work in delivering meaningful access. It's not about just talking about the policies but making all the actors do what they are supposed to do and that is why you cannot exempt especially in the global south um, governments. I'll stop here for now. Thank you. Thank you Ponselet. I think that that's a very useful and interesting reflection. Um, until now, we have gone through free connectivity case, let's say, but as you, uh, you have listened, in reality, uh, connectivity is intimate linked with the rest, is linked to digital inclusion, linked with capacity building. So now, going to capacity building, I think that Nambura uh, can talk with us about mm, another experience that is in the report, that is Prida. Could you, that is friend of Frida, but this is different. So, what is Prida? Thank you, Giacomo. Good afternoon to all of us, uh, and thank you for choosing to be in this particular session. So I'm going to discuss PRIDA, a project I've been working uh, on for the last three years, building capacities, and just to let you know what is PRIDA. PRIDA is a joint initiative of the African Union Commission, uh, it, uh, European Union, and the International Telecommunication Union. And basically what we are doing at PRIDA is to build, uh, it has three main tracks, the first one being to address various dimensions of broadband demand and supply in Africa. I know that's what we have been talking about, access at the uh, remote parts of this country, and this is being implemented by ITU. We are also harmonizing measurable ICT telecommunication policy, legal, and regulatory frameworks. <coughs> Again, we know as a continent, there are 55 countries. So basically, while we realize harmonization will not be really possible because we have to contextualize, at least we need to come up with the frameworks, and that's what we are doing. And the third one, which is why we are here, is uh, uh, mainstreaming the ID structures and processes and building the capacities of the African Union members. So what, why do we have PRIDA for this case? 
In 2018, there was an African Union declaration on internet governance and development of the African digital economy. And that is after realizing that as a continent, we are not yet there. We are not discussing uh, issues at the international level, at the regional level, and we need really to be there. So the de declaration encouraged participation of African stakeholders in the global IG debate through engagement at the national, regional, and continental level, so that when we are coming at the global level, we are going there as a common voice. And it's also based on multi-stakeholder process on IG principles, open, accessible, resilient, and interoperable internet with localized ID debates and related policy matters. So through PRIDA, we are supporting this declaration. And how are we doing it? Through streamlining IG processes at the national, regional, and continental. And we are doing that by ensuring that we are supporting schools of internet governance at the national level, supporting at the regional level, and the continental level, and ensuring that issues are escalating from the national, regional, and continental, and dealing with issues that are cross-cutting. So we are doing in terms of uh, internet governance and also in terms of schools of IG. So going to the third slide. We are implementing a strategy that we developed in 2019 with two main issues, processes and capacity building. And this stand is about capacity building. So in terms of capacity doing, uh, building, what have we done? In 2020, during COVID, we realized that regardless of the situation, we still had to build capacity. And we came up with an online curriculum of internet governance. It has seven modules contextualized while well, it is addressing the global issues, the baskets of internet governance as per Diplo uh, case, we are also trying to contextualize it at the national level. And so once we came up with this curriculum and we simplified it to ensure that we can run it in a period of five days and it is self-paced so that participants, they don't have to be online all through. And through that curriculum, we have trained 17 countries. And our model, again, we looked at the 55 African Union member states and we realized out of these 23 African Union member states, 23 did not have any internet governance or IG structures or processes. So we focused on those countries. And you can see, I'm, I'm not going to mention them, so these are the countries we have supported so far, 17 of them. We are still short of three, which we are still working on to ensure by, that by the end of the PRIDA project, which is uh, June 2023, we will have dealt with those countries that will have IG processes, will have started doing the capacity building. Again, using the same curriculum that is available in French, English, and uh, Portuguese. We have been able to support regional IGs. We have done it with the West African IG. We are working on uh, Central Africa IG. We'll be doing it in January. In North Africa, we are doing it in December. So basically, we are working with different countries to make sure that they are contextualizing that particular content and discussing issues at the national level, at the village level, to ensure that everybody is included. Again, what we are doing, we are using our local experts. We have trained people across the continent to be facilitators, to understand uh, from a country perspective, so that while we are discussing at the regional, continental, and the like, we have experts from that particular country to help us with that. And we are working with the regulators, the Ministry of uh, ICT, to ensure that the government is involved. Because the whole idea is not just to build capacity, but uh, to create a, stakeholder, a multi stakeholder environment. So far, we have done 29 sessions, and we have been able to we have been able to, to train more than 1,466 participants. So in terms of uh, results, I think we have discussed results, and I see Jay Como is on my case. Just to show you that particular slide that shows the outcome uh, in terms of gender, because for us, gender is very important. We realize that women must be brought in this digital space. And in terms of uh, recruitment, while we go out uh, on our way to ensure that we get as many women as possible, we don't get 50-50. But as you can note, in terms of completion, women complete more than men, which means <laughs> we need to encourage more women because we are more resilient. Once we get into something, we ensure we end, we go up to the end. So for us, that is good. So why is uh, Prida a good practice? This is the last slide. And basically, it's because of our continental approach that we are doing a continental project, but then contextualizing up to the village level. Most of the people we are training, they have not used computers and the like, but they are, uh, the government or the national convener, they bring them together to ensure that we are doing that. We are doing a stakeholder approach. We are contextualizing the, the content to ensure that we are addressing all the things that are affecting us individually. individually. Flexible training. Uh, approaches that you, it is self-paced, you can use the curriculum at your own pace, 
uh, focus on inclusion, 50-50 gender, and then focus on the youth. We realize if we don't go along with the youth, then we, are not, we, are, we won't be in a good place. So again, we are emphasizing on that. We are uh, focusing on sustainability, because again, we realize once we do the training, we need to have multiplier effect. The a facilitator that we are working with, we are working with Pan-African University to ensure that our curriculum is embedded into their curriculum as a bachelor's or a master's course that can be used as an elective course. Thank you very much, and back to you, Giacomo. Thank you, Margaret. You will have less minutes later, huh? <laughs> to be fair to the others. So, the, um, we, are, we have moved to the capacity building, as you see, and I ask somebody in the room uh, to prepare itself to discuss about an example of digital Africa that is insisting in capacity building too, uh, but we will come to him in a minute. While I think that now we can go to Onika, because Onika, you are on the border between uh, capacity building and uh, digital inclusion. Okay, great. Thank you. It's, it's always great to uh, speak uh, about digital inclusion after someone has uh, made it quite clear that uh, gender is important, so we don't have to fight about that one. Um, so I'm going to uh, give a few examples on uh, how we've used uh, capacity building to build out on uh, digital inclusion. But first, I just want to make a comment that it's really important for us to make sure that uh, the digital space does not replicate the gender inequalities that exist in our society. We need to continuously uh, you know, make sure that that happens. And it, it's not going to happen on its own just because it's digital. Uh, we, we can't use the we build it and they come uh, approach. We have to actually be quite intentional about making sure that the digital spaces actually include women. So our digital development goals need to be uh, very clear on setting targets. And to that, uh, our team worked on developing a curriculum for mainstreaming gender in ICT policy to actually uh, do training for policymakers uh, directly to help assist them with how do we mainstream gender in ICT policy. And unlike in this room, uh, at times we had to start with why that's important, but I'm, I'm happy we don't you know, have to do that here. I think we all agree that it's important that gender is mainstreamed, and so we developed this uh, program. And before that, I think it's really important to say that part of the impetus for m working around mainstreaming gender and ICT policy specifically actually came as um, a charge from a summit of African women who, and, and girls who had a summit in Ghana working at the intersection of technology and policy and gave us some matching orders around how we need a policy environment that is intentional about closing the digital gender divide. In this, uh, we trained uh, policymakers in West Africa as well as East and Southern Africa. Out of the West Africa training, I can give two examples where uh, Senegal, uh, in their Digital Senegal plan, actually have very high level commitments uh, to mainstream gender uh, in broadband uh, policy for that particular country, with very clear target of 33% rate of e-commerce participation and public services by women specifically in the rural areas. Uh, very important. As well as Benin, uh, in their universal service and access uh, uh, policy, actually uh, includes the mainstreaming of gender and, and some very uh, gendered targets to make sure that women are included. Uh, because if we don't have targets, then we can't really measure the progress that we are making towards attaining uh, these goals. On the Southern and East Africa part, uh, those two actually took place together as opposed to just separately. But uh, uh, Uganda specifically, the regulator there, uh, embarked on a uh, gender data research project immediately after going through this training. Because one of the challenges that we find is that because 
if uh, the data, sometimes the data is not segregated. So you need to be able to do segregated data to be able to know and understand exactly where the women are in your country and, and be able to uh, develop policies and strategies to ensure that you are addressing uh, the inequalities there. And because directly because of that uh, particular project, uh, Uganda has actually gone as far as including uh, very specific targets and goals uh, to address gender divide in their US universal service and access uh, projects that include um, items such as subsidizing devices for poor households uh, more specifically. And uh, I can also give an example with Ghana, where Ghana also in their US, used their USF as an instrument to uh, mainstream gender and address the gaps that exist for women and girls through uh, skills development. And you'll find that most of these are also on the demand side. So while connectivity is important, it's really equally important to make sure we address the demand side issues because for the most part, women are not online because of affordability, but it's also because of skills and it's also because of the safety and environmental issues that exist uh, in our online spaces presently. Uh, so who else? So in terms of the, the policy recommendations that we, we look at, um, and this is, I'm just wrapping up, it's really important that we take the advantage of uh, leveraging the USFs uh, so that they can explicitly be, they can be used to explicitly address a digital gender gap and support uh, women's uh, connectivity, especially demand side issues like I've mentioned with skills and um, devices sometimes. But we should also be open to making policy processes uh, that are public uh, through consultations because it's only through making sure that women are included in the policy consultations processes that we are able to understand exactly how to implement and, and, and work on uh, interventions that directly uh, benefit them. So, so I like to use the, the slogan of nothing about us without us. So as we look at policy development, let's be inclusive, let's go to the rural areas, let's find a way for women to engage and tell us because then we won't end up with situations of digital centers where women are not coming because of either transport issues or safety issues. However, if we consult them in advance, we are able to do so. And lastly, but not least, um, we need to be open to not only new digital uh, technologies such as using community networks to be able to connect women, but we need to begin to look for different financial models, including the possibility of using uh, funds that exist to subsidize devices and education for women. Thank you. Thank you, Onika. <coughs> So, before we pass to uh, the next speaker in, in the panel, I would like to ask uh, Laurent Ferrali, that is here for ICANN, to tell us a word about um, Digital Africa project, that is a capacity building project, <coughs> and that was presented this morning, so we don't know too much yet, but he will tell us. Thank you, Jacob. Uh, Laurent Ferrali from ICANN. Uh, <coughs> yes, the uh, coalition for Digital Africa is not an, I an ICANN project. Um, it's ICANN with a lot of different partners, including AD, ITU, for example. Uh, we have uh, this global uh, coalition for digital Africa, but we have this global coalition, we have different projects, and um, um, there are several projects which are directly um, um, uh, related to capacity building activities, especially when it comes to uh, the support we are planning to provide uh, to uh, 10 uh, CCTLDs in Africa. Uh, you know that um, in Africa, some countries are still struggling with their own CCTLDs. And for us, it's crystal clear that you cannot develop in a strong digital economy, in, in a good e-government services without a good CCTLD. So, so you, you have already identified these 10 countries, so this is still a work in progress? No, we have already uh, uh, select 10 countries. Uh, the criteria were, I mean, we, we are trying to find a good balance, a geographical balance, and a francophone, anglophone balance, etc., and different situation. And um, so we have 10 countries. You want to list some countries? No? Yeah. Okay. Please. 
because we are looking for free countries to join PRIDA, as Margaret I mean, <laughs> told us. It, it, now it, we need it, to it, the it, country. It's only a pilot, only a pilot phase, uh, so this pilot phase will, um, it's, it's for 2023. It's 10 countries, it's a pilot phase, so at the end of the pilot phase we will be able to have a, a global uh, blueprint for a um, future, um, uh, future support to these CCTLDs. Why we have partners on this is that for many years, uh, we, I mean ICANN and other technical organizations, were providing some uh, technical capacity building uh, support uh, to different CCLDs. But uh, it was not a success because, you know, you can train uh, tech people, but these people will not stay with your registry if you are not doing any business, if you are not growing. So this is why we uh, we, we understood that uh, we need to have a more holistic approach and, and try to help them from a technical capacity building technical perspective, from um, train them uh, to develop their business and the, ne the, the, ne the network of researchers, registrars, etc marketing, uh, obviously this is not what I can, can do. So this is why we are doing this with different partners. ICANN is dealing with the capacity, cap cap sorry, capacity building, um, technical capacity building, and we have other partners. We will uh, train uh, these registries in different uh, fields such as you know, marketing, uh, developing um, a strategy to develop the CTLDs in, in, the, in, the, in the country. Of course, it's a holistic approach. We are planning to work with different stakeholders at the local level. And, um, and of course, yes, there is a governance discussion that every country should have. But the, I mean, our approach is that we are not, I mean, ICANN, IHUD, and, other, and the other partners, we are not planning to come to a country and tell people what they have to do. We are coming with a toolkit, with experience, with knowledge, uh, with uh, best practices uh, from, uh, from um, I mean, some countries in, in, Af in Africa, and we are helping people to develop their own uh, strategy. It's, uh, it's uh, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Laurent. I took this as a voluntary uh, conscription that you will write now a case that we will add at the, in the report. You have one week to do so because we have to deliver the report. So thank you for your gesture. And I see that Tulio is uh, going far away, but uh, I want to have him in, in two minutes, if possible. Can you stay till? Okay. Uh, Roberto, you have been uh, one of the members of the network of experts that contributed to the intersessional work of which today is the final cherry cake. Um, what do you think that, um, what you have learned from what the speakers have t told us till now? Thank you very much, Giacomo. Uh, well, I think since this is a new intersessional format, this uh, is an evolution perhaps of the best practice forms that we used to have and par part of the, the particular history of this uh, policy network is based on that intention originally three years ago. I will say that uh, the main objective is to gather all these great experiences, such as the ones that we were heard about recently, um, because it's important to spread these kind of experiences all over the world in order to our countries, our communities, our multi-stakeholder communities learn from these experiences. Um, even, all the, even though the great work that uh, we've done during the, this, this last year, we didn't get all the great contributions that we know there are in different other countries and regions. And hopefully, if this uh, policy network continues to, to work in the, in the following years, because as you know, Giacomo, every year it's a, it's a part of the MAC decision to know if this is going to continue. Hopefully, this policy network, since it is, it's greatly important to continue the debate about connecting everyone and meaningfully, Hopefully, we will have this in the next year. And for the next year, one of the important things that we're going to repeat is to make this call for uh, examples of policies all around the world, again, to spread between all the community. Thank you very much. Thank yeah. you, Roberto. So, as I said, 
before Tullio has to leave us, but you have heard from many speakers that um, are talking about the importance of <coughs> national governmental policies, subsidies, incentives. Uh, what is the view of Brazil government that has been involved in this uh, for many years? Thank you very much. Uh, and, uh, I, I, like I have to warn that you are not prepared, you were not aware of the question, so <laughs> don't feel fine. obliged to. Um, uh, Thank you so much. Um, uh, addressing digital divides is a, a priority for Brazil, and uh, our regulator has been uh, doing an amazing work in uh, uh, achieving universal access to the internet. And uh, this is a great opportunity, actually, because five minutes after we finish our session here, another session at uh, Banquet Hall B is going to be starting. Uh, on uh, community networks as human rights uh, enablers. And um, uh, so they are going to be covering a lot of these examples and uh, uh, the importance of meaningful uh, connectivity. The challenge that we have now uh, uh, in Brazil is actually very much related to how to expand uh, the uh, meaningful access, not only from the perspective of uh, uh, providing infrastructure, which be, would be um, analogous, for example, to a first generation kind of connectivity rights, but also uh, to enable the meaningful access, which uh, is actually at the very core of the uh, invaluable uh, work that um, uh, uh, the policy network is doing. Uh, but uh, one uh, very important dimension that uh, the IGF here in Addis Ababa and in African soil has provided us with uh, is uh, also a meaningful connectivity that is related to data divides. And then I, I would also take this opportunity uh, to um, ask the panel for, 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 for some questions that uh, uh, would relate to the presentation of the uh, UNCTAD uh, Digital Economy Report in 2021, which has indicated the risks of digital divide for developing countries as um, um, that could put developing countries in a position of mere uh, providers of raw data material. And um, um, one particular concern that we have would be how to prevent that uh, digital access um, wouldn't expand a model that is already related to the gig economy, uh, which instead of promoting human rights and promoting the SDGs, actually impair agency, empower, and human dignity. How would we actually ensure that go beyond uh, uh, the infrastructure and, and access uh, to a model in which we would prevent what we have been raising here in Addis Ababa, the model of digital colonialism or digital imperialism in which human themselves would be turned into um, uh, raw, uh, raw material in the uh, global supply chains. Thank you. Thank you, Tulio. So this means that when the report will be ready, we will send a copy to you and we will ask what the Brazilian government can learn lessons from the, what we are suggesting here. Thank you very much for your warning. And in fact, now we are moving to the last question that um, is about digital inclusion. Even if you see that the barriers are not so strong between the various pillars we are discussing. But now we are going, we are moving something different and this um, is the, uh, the services and the products that are, and that are made in the languages of the people living in a certain country. That this gives the meaningful uh, content to, to the people, meaningful service, not transforming them from pure consumers into citizen, digital citizens. So, in this, we have two examples that uh, struck the attention of the, um, of the team. Uh, one of the examples comes from Internews, and we have Chris with us that will uh, briefly present this case. Thank you, Giacomo. Thank you, everyone. Do you have slides, I see? Is that coming through? Okay. So in the meantime, 
You know that one of the main consequences of digitalization is that in many countries are disappearing local media outlets because they, um, they don't have any more the advertising revenues to survive. So internews take care of this problem and try to transform a, a disadvantage into an opportunity in order to ensure the perennity of the uh, local media. Is this correct? That's a great introduction, yes. <laughs> Thank you, Giacomo. Um, I'm Chris Ajecki, Director of Ads for News, uh, an initiative within Internews, and I'll just jump right into the model. Uh, Ads for News supports uh, trusted local news by driving increased programmatic ad revenue to their websites. And before I go into more details, let me set up some of the conditions for why this is actually viable today. So first off, the problem. Um, local news is being cut out of digital ad spending, as you mentioned in the beginning, and that's resulting in local communities losing access to quality journalism and also culturally relevant information to help them make better decisions about their lives. Um, we've heard this story, of course. We've heard this story again and again. Um, in terms of cutting digital ad spend, we've also heard about exclusion lists, blacklists, uh, global brands avoiding news altogether. Uh, we've heard about big tech taking a bigger chunk of uh, revenues. And of course, we've also heard that more ads are going to social media. But all that said, the digital ad market still is massive. It's uh, around 560 billion USD annually in 2022, and it's growing at nearly 15% year over year. So if we think about publishers and, and as a, a media development practitioner, of course, we always recommend diversifying your revenue streams, subscriptions, consumer revenues, commercial revenues, and other streams. But it, it's hard to ignore. And of course, we recommend that programmatic advertising be included. Um, and, and digital publishers uh, striving to ensure they're capturing some programmatic revenue. Aside from the growth, the other dynamic that lends itself to the model is that brands and agencies are looking for more brand safe inventory outside of social media networks. And there's a great article in Financial Times titled, Who Killed the Social Ad Boom? And, and even more recently, some of you may have seen the article about Twitter and global brands pulling back from that platform. The last dynamic to highlight here is that brands are making more socially conscious or socially responsible purchasing decisions throughout their supply chains, um, from product packaging and, and now even to media buying. Um, and that's in, in socially responsible media buying or ethical advertising is a bit of a new concept. I think it's just in the last 18 months or so has made it onto the agenda of global brands. So how we accomplish our goal is by vetting news websites by country according to journalism and advertising industry standards. Uh, and, and the big part of this is we leverage local media experts uh, in each country that where this research is being conducted. And, and we're in about 35 markets right now. We have uh, active research going on in about 12 markets. And uh, hopefully by the end of 2023, we'll be in 60 markets globally. The key to this whole thing working is, of course, identifying uh, and partnering with the demand side, the agencies and brands that actually value reaching quality content and buying more ethically. And, and that list is, is small but growing. Um, and then the last additional result of this work is defunding websites that publish hate speech and mis- and disinformation. For the last slide, I'd just like to share um, an end-to-end an end -end look of this, at this process and, and share some um, thoughts around it. Um, first thing to say here is that this is really about inclusion. We are trying to open the door to as many legitimate news outlets as possible. Uh, you know, it's, it's quite easy to identify the, the, the award-winning journalist outlets out there. Um, the Rapplers, the Malaysia Kinneys of the world. And it's also pretty easy to you know, identify 
the bad actors, <laughs> the ones that are doing some maliciously bad stuff. But it's actually that middle group, the outlets that have one, two, three, four journalists that are producing original content and, and, and offering uh, a valuable service to communities uh, that they serve that we want to surface for the global agencies and global brands. Because it's that middle group that really is not on the radar of um, global agencies and, and brands. Thank you, Chris. So if this wasn't a PowerPoint, the funnel would be upright, yes? No, please, if you go to a conclusion, because then we pass to the Yes, next. thank you. Thank you. Um, the whole process works with, a, um, this is an example of, of Indonesia. We had a total universe of about 20,000 20, websites. We boiled that down through an analysis, an algorithmic analysis to about 1,200, and then um, we ended up with a trusted news a website list of about 650 uh, sites, and those will be then handed over to um, agencies and brands to target. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think that this food for thought uh, for, uh, I don't know if Vint uh, can refer to his friends in Blue Mountain about that, but no, no, but I will ask you later. But first, I would conclude with the last speaker. Um, that is a similar experience because we are talking of media and we are talking of media for the citizen on a certain region, so. Exactly. Um, so that's actually, I would like to say first of all that we've got a very di um, gender balanced audio, uh, panelist, which is very good to see because normally you'll only see one side. Um, but I want to take up um, you know, the, the previous panelists' um, comments and what I would like to do is actually talk about the inclusive and affordability of content. As I said earlier, um, so Habesha View actually, what, what we've done is that try and promote locally created contents in its own original languages uh, by, first of all, in 2015, trying to build a platform that's accessible for everybody, uh, which will be um, people are able to, to watch it globally. And we also focus on locally created contents, whichever country we work in. Uh, we tend to also use the original language it's made in, uh, we don't believe in dubbing. Uh, that means we are transferring culture as it is straight away from um, the original content creators. We also give um, a platform for content creators wherever they are so that they can monetize. Uh, one of the things we earlier heard was that how difficult it is to get data. Um, obviously, I come from the private sector, so my angle is different to my other panelists. Um, so talking about data, um, specifically in Africa, that's one of the, the major barriers of accessibility and affordability. Um, streaming platform like ours and many others depends on providing content that people can access it easily and affordability. Uh, we can provide it for free or we can provide it with um, AVOD or SVOD. But again, if they don't have the data available or they can afford to pay for it, it makes it very difficult. Um, I would also like to go back to the gender balance um, in terms of when we are talking about um, internet and inclusivity and accessibility, it's actually a very good way of um, covering both genders because um, if, for example, 50% um, of women or 50% you know, of the uh, population tends to be um, working from home or would not be able to have access, they could still access content or information and documents such like by, by using internet. Um, that's, that's one of the things I would like um, to say. Um, and the next thing is also how do we make it relevant to the person who is actually watching that content because that's very, very important. Um, I think we're all aware how dynamic the big streamers and the big um, companies are coming to Africa in floods uh, in the last three, four years, even five years we've seen uh, large streamers and production companies are coming. Um, mainly because that is because the next market is in Africa and there's a huge continent with a huge population with the middle classes um, growing very quickly. Again, this means that we need to focus in homegrown content that actually reflects the culture and the origin and the language of those countries. Um, there is nothing wrong with importing international content because that does show us how the world lives outside, but it's also very important to preserve the cultures of those um, countries. Uh, that's also where we focus on uh, trying to make sure that um, the languages, the, the cultures are honored and we do, um, when necessary, um, add um, 
subtitling to make it, uh, to make it accessible. Again, uh, the art industry, probably as most people would know, is one of the struggling ones. So you've got the technology which does very well and then we have the art and culture which tends to struggle financially um, getting a production done. It's very expensive sometimes, financially very, very hard. But by monetizing some of these contents, we're able to let the content creator continue the, telling their stories again without the restriction of either depending on the large organization who dictates how much content is available, or what is actually told um, as well. So I want to focus back on to homegrown. Um, I said earlier, I'm Ethiopian. We, you know, I'm tech and media um, entrepreneur. Uh, we have an office here. So we're working from the grassroots. How do we bring those contents to the international market, but without limiting their ability to tell the story as they see it, rather than customize it to suit um, a Western audience uh, and language is also very important and preserving cultures which are in the minority. I hope that kind of answers uh, the speech also. Um, so at the moment we work in, uh, in most of African countries. Uh, in Ethiopia we use, all, we use all the languages. Amharic being one of the main ones. We have Oromia, um, Tigrinya, Gurage, all those languages we use. Our system also which we have, um, I forgot to say earlier, is we invested huge amount of uh, does have automatic translation, so we can use it in West Africa, East Africa, Southeast Asia. So the translation, uh, some of the main languages are automatically translated, others are done manually. So we are you know, providing this platform, as I said earlier, to uh, working with telcos, which is very important. Obviously, we want to get their uh, very inexpensive data, if we're able to do so, and the broadcasters and other content creators to be able to use it. So we would like, in the future, this... Um, platform to be a pan-African platform that anybody can use it and monetize their content. Thank you very much. I see a lot of syn potential synergies with uh, platforms if they uh, accept to, to invest in local contents and to support the local creativity. But this will come in a minute before. Sonia, you have followed very passionately and silently, that is very hard for you, I know, uh, to all the discussion. Uh, what, you, what is your reaction first, and uh, if do you have collected any reaction from remote participants? Thank you. Thank you, Giacomo. Uh, no reactions or questions yet from the remote participants. Uh, I would say I'm incredibly pleased to hear all of these fantastic examples from our speakers. It's really a testament of how uh, much you know, um, incredible work and, and most importantly impactful work is taking place across the world from different kinds of organizations, from the most grassroots organizations to private sector. And I think that's really encouraging to see, you know, for those of us who work on digital inclusion and frankly seeing how much is still to be done and, and really instead of progress, uh, quite a bit of uh, regression in terms of how things have taken place recently. It's good to be uh, listening to all of you and seeing the possibilities. I enjoyed all of the cases, but I'm not gonna say much now, Giacomo, because I know time is flying, and I wanna hear from the panelists again. So I'm gonna pass on to you to ask them to come back again and share a bit more with us. Uh, I think everyone is learning a lot, just as me, and I'm very thankful to, to be hearing from them. So back to you for more of our panels. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Sonia, have a look, because Carlos Afonso said that eventually he would intervene from remote. If you see around, ask him if he's eventually to want to intervene. Okay, so thank you. The, now the, the ball is again here. Uh, before to go to the um, panelists uh, for the second round, uh, yes, Vin, the privilege of the age, is the youngest among us. Well. <laughs> I don't take this off, but I, get my, I hear myself twice. Um, I just wanted to emphasize something that I heard more than once in, uh, in the various uh, interventions today. Uh, one of them has to do with taking actions that have an enabling effect. And to come uh, specifically to uh, what was evident is that localization is more than just language. Um, localization is about local content that's relevant. Uh, and simple, maybe silly example is that uh, if you are uh, in Nairobi and you're searching for help with a plumbing problem, it doesn't help you to find out a plumber in New York City. So localization is more than just local languages, it's also local content. 
That raises a very interesting policy possibility. Uh, in Canada, there are some rules about content and uh, where the content to, from, uh, the, that goes into entertainment comes from. And there are limits on how much non-Canadian content is allowed. So I could imagine um, a kind of practice that says to uh, even those big companies that are eager to reach African audiences, that a certain fraction of what is made available has to be uh, of local origin and local relevance. And it seems to me that, um, that we should be thinking more and more about regulatory choices that are simultaneously enabling for local sources to be heard and to make use of platforms that, that enjoy significant uh, capacity. And so I'm really glad to, to hear this focus on localization because I think that's a key uh, way of making the internet meaningful uh, in local contexts. Thank you very much. That's uh, very good that it comes from you. <laughs> okay, um, there is time for a few questions. <laughs> no, no, not yet. <laughs> okay, let's start from the gentleman that was the first asking. The one over there. Uh, thanks so much. No, uh, the one beyond the end, yeah. please. Uh, thanks so much, Talan Sultanov, Internet State Kyrgyzstan chapter. I wanted to bring the perspective of small countries like Kyrgyzstan. Its population is half of Addis Ababa. And that's why creating content in Kyrgyz language is very difficult. And we didn't realize how big of a problem this was until we started this digital skills project uh, with the support of EU called Sanarit Insan. We have this little knowledge box called Ilim Box of two terabyte. We could only fill it by one third. So it's two-thirds empty because there is no educational content in Kyrgyz language. And what helped us is actually the open source materials produced uh, globally. Uh, we, we found a uh, repository of uh, science experiments, biology, chemistry, uh, uh, which we translated into Kyrgyz language. And we thought this would be helpful for rural kids, but actually it's been helpful to rural teachers. And what's even more, it's been helpful to kids of migrants, of Kyrgyz people who are working abroad. So this was really a surprising uh, discovery for us. And uh, uh, another example that we've been using is the GSMA's uh, MIST uh, toolkit. So uh, what I wanted to uh, highlight here is that uh, big organizations, uh, when you produce these kind of knowledge products, they are really helpful. Thank you for that. And if you design them from the beginning, adaptable to local languages, that will be even more helpful. Thank you. So I assume this is not a question, but it's, uh, it's a uh, comment. Uh, it's, uh, some examples. If you send to us, we will try to include, if not in this report, in the next one, because it looks quite interesting. So the gentleman near the lady. OK, uh, my name is Raul Plummer. I'm from the Electronic Frontier Finland. Uh, and I think we all agree that connecting the last mile doesn't make business sense for the ISPs. And I've reached the same conclu conclusion as Ponselet. Uh, that the governments need to give a matching tax exemption for ISPs in exchange for some free bandwidth. Uh, and um, the actual internet, uh, for uh, to get out of the community networks uh, to, the, to the actual internet, that's the real most interesting part of the internet. Um, and I think this approach could also be popular uh, with the politicians who could actually be effectively be opening the internet for the rural areas and the so-called last mile especially. Uh, and at least for me, the trading some tax income for connecting people to the internet seems like a very popular policy indeed. And my question is, um, do other, uh, other panelists feel that this kind of free bandwidth given by the ISPs for the community networks could actually be achieved? And do you know if this has happened somewhere already? Thank you very much. Very sensitive question. Please. Thank you so much. Um, I'd like to thank you, uh, the panelists, all of you. You mentioned the most critical issue on local content and how important it is to have co local content and content that is relevant because we can have meaningful access without local content. My other point, which would also come from there, is I don't know how many organizations are in this uh, building, but are we looking also at device access and device cost? 
Because if you are looking, I would say, from, uh, from an African perspective and from a rural women, rural perspective, it's very difficult for you to get a phone. But when you do get a phone, you get um, not those expensive inf uh, phone that you can download, you can stream, you can use information, um, you can access information that is meaningful. So is there any way or any interventions that you are doing on device access and device cost? So that in as much as we might have access to the internet, if you do not have a gadget that is going to help you access it. And I'm Wadzanai from Zimbabwe. Thank you. Okay, then the gentleman there and then... Thank you. My name is Al. I'm from Kenya. I'm from the Open Institute. So in the time that I've been here, I've heard a lot of uh, work that is being done by many, many organizations and civil society organizations and private sector. And I just wanted to know, considering the fact that the internet doesn't speak most of our languages, um, is there an initiative of any kind that the panelists are aware of that sort of brings together um, the, you know, the various activities or initiatives of different um, groups to try and push for a unified global set of principles or policy or um, uh, convention. Thank you. Gentlemen there, and then we go back to the panelists. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Chair, for, for the floor. Uh, I will uh, go ahead in, uh, in French, please. Okay. But, uh, it's better. It's better, this one. Euh, oui, donc merci pour, pour cette, excellent, cette excellente présentation. Et je voudrais revenir sur le côté gender, où on voit très bien qu'un certain nombre d'organisations internationales, dont les Nations Unies, l'UIT, GSMA, préconisent et l'Union Européenne, d'ailleurs, ont des plans pour promouvoir le gender au niveau de toutes les strates de la société. Alors, je voudrais poser une question aux panélistes. Quels seraient, d'après vous, les, les facteurs, les points de blocage les plus significatifs, hormis, bien sûr, la volonté politique qu'on peut mettre à toutes les sources, hein, mais hormis ces points-là, quels sont les facteurs de blocage les plus significants sur lesquels il faudra appuyer pour avancer Et autre point également important qui me semble euh, intéressant de partager avec vous, c'est que... Pourquoi ne pas inscrire dans les rapports de, de l'IGF 17 une recommandation forte pour la promotion du genre, notamment dans les nouvelles technologies, dans l'Internet, dans, dans les métiers de l'Internet, mais non pas seulement inscrire une recommandation qui serait un petit peu laconique, mais une recommandation suivie d'un plan d'action qui pourrait s'inspirer, pourquoi pas, du, du plan Marshall à l'époque des États-Unis, où on a bien vu que sans ce plan Marshall, ben, les États-Unis ne seraient pas ce qu'ils sont aujourd'hui. Donc, pour bien sensibiliser l'ensemble des acteurs, je pense qu'il faudrait inscrire une recommandation suivie d'actions, et quand je dis plan Marshall, bien d'une autre philosophie qui s'apparente, mais pour montrer un signal fort à nos dirigeants. Merci. Merci beaucoup. Je vais traduire après, sinon nos collègues ne comprendront pas. Bertrand, you have the last word. Sorry. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Giacomo. Uh, my question is for Ms. Esquivede. Um, you described the... Uh, yeah, sorry, thank you. You described the, uh, your business model as giving uh, local producers of local cultural content a chance to monetize using the technology through your platform. Can you sort of talk about how you address issues of affordability uh, relative to the purchasing power of the countries that you're serving in Africa? Thank you. So, I think that we have uh, many questions on the table. Ponsele, you want to take over about the community network? Yeah, yeah I, I think um, one of the things, um, if we are linking the community networks to, um, especially to um, localization and content, we have to discover that in Africa, there are a few places that um, Tigas can mention about um, Amharic and all these things. Those are standard Swahili. But take West Africa, for example, um, Fulani, different dialects. Mandinka, different dialects. Um, it goes on Hausa, different dialects. Um, and um, you want to do localization with that. And the best, thing, the best example I know about that, we have an organization in Gambia that was actually incubated in my hub, um, Joko Labs, and they work on gender-based violence and also, also, also online violence for women. And they record all these messages uh, in the local languages, so in voice, 
and then they send it by WhatsApp messages in different WhatsApp groups, and the women can now use it for um, to solve their various problems. Because with the issue of language, the, the reality in most African countries is that we we have to adopt better our French, Portuguese, English, Arabic we inherited, and if that cannot be done in a lot of rural communities, voice is the best option. It's not like East Africa, whether Swahili or Amharic, and you have all those things there. So we have to know that the dialect is a very big issue. I remember some years ago, um, Google wanted us to do something on Fulani language to translate it to become online. In just um, six countries, you mix it with the Pulo we had about 10 different dialects, you know, so voice is the way to go. I'll stop there for now. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's very meaningful. And I think that, I don't know if you have heard, there was the UNESCO Deputy Director General here. Uh, he was talking about the effort they are doing on multilingualism on the internet. I think that if you are interested in that, uh, you have interest to follow what, we, what they are doing. Um, there, there have been a couple of questions about gender. The last in French I briefly translate is uh, he's asking if there is, what is the mo main point of blockage that you see uh, ampering the participation of women through this process? Uh, please, Margaret or Monica. Okay, I can start. Uh, that uh, first of all is about uh, from my experience, is about localized content. And I know one of the panelists has talked about that, that you will find there's too much content here. And again, we are talking about broadband up to the village level. But do our people have the right content to do what they need to do in the digital space. I really get worried when I go to my village, because I always like working from there. And you find all these young people grouped together, young women accessing content, but this content may not be addressing their socioeconomic needs. So again, we need to contextualize what we are doing. Go to a particular village, a particular country, see what do they need, uh, what do they do for their socioeconomic livelihoods, and with that, then customize the content. The case of M-Pesa, every person, whether you are educated or not in Kenya, they have M-Pesa, and they always know when the money is not the right amount, and they're like, why? Because there is interest, it is addressing their needs. So again, women, we need to ensure that we are really focused on that. And again, when it comes to uh, digital hygiene at the household level, because again, women will fear when probably their introduction to the internet is through content that they did not appreciate or it is not appropriate. With that, they will even block their young children. So again, we have to combine that. Uh, digital hygiene at the household level, let us ensure that we are working with the regulators to ensure that the right content is being shown. Thank you. Yeah. On that, yes, I will add that um, affordability is still an issue. Uh, even at the now not so great one for two uh, target, we still have many countries in this continent that are still spending more than 2% of average monthly income on uh, one gig of data per month. So affordability is a huge issue for women. Then the second issue is the issue of digital skills and affordable devices, which I think someone uh, brought up here. Uh, the devices are still uh, very expensive. Our last research uh, showed us that some countries, it's 40 to 60 percent of average monthly income. That's uh, the cost of a microwave, uh, small appliance uh, for a household. And lastly, uh, the issue of, on, of violence against women online needs to be addressed uh, to make sure that women are safe. And and they are not now associating being online with uh, something negative. Not addressing violence online actually has an impact on the next generation of young girls who will also opt out of the space. And of young boys, because they got the wrong impression that the world is, uh, is a jungle. Mm. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, now, the, the, the last question I think that, um, no, there was the one about the devices. Nobody there to answer. You want to answer? Okay. I think no, I'll, I'll, I'll take that challenge. The, please. Um, it's, Affordability has yes, been. It's very much so. It's underlined <laughs> by everybody, yes. and also for Chris, uh, online. Please yes. go. Um, I, I fully understand um, the affordability is a criteria as well as the, the lady over there said. How how do these um, uh, consumers actually access uh, devices? It is still very expensive in Africa. Uh, let alone we can't have the very brand new. Um, uh, 
big names um, as well as little ones. So from, my, from our point of view, what we've been trying to do is in parts of Africa, we've been trying to work with telcos who've been very kind enough to allow us to give um, some not very high tech, but lower type of devices for people to use our service. That's one. It's not everywhere. And I think it's very important to have a partnership with either telcos, manufacturers, or even the government of each country to be able to provide that um, device to the, the people who need it the most. When I say about content, I'm talking about different ways. I'm talking about entertainment, I'm talking about education, language, maths, um, children's content. So it's a wide variety of contents that we are providing as a company, which we source from um, third party producers, studios, and such like. So we're also very aware of. Uh, gender violence, both for men and women, uh, boys and girls. So we are wary of making sure that we watch every content that's produced and given to us, and that's on our platform. If it doesn't conform to that, we do put uh, a warning. Obviously, we don't want to censor anybody, but we do add uh, a warning to that. So that's one of the um, device accessibility. Um, downloadable, I think somebody asked as well. Um, bearing in mind, piracy is a big problem um, in, in Africa, all over, actually, I would say. Uh, but it, it becomes... I can speak from parts of Africa that it's become acceptable that you can download and share that content. Of course, it makes it very difficult for a company like ours and many others to be able to say download this content and use it. Because at the end of the day, the producers and the content owners need to earn money to be able to create or even support their families. Um, so that's very, very important as well. Um, telcos and governments are very important in providing access to data. I think a lot of telecommunication companies in Africa, I'm not the only one saying this, are earning quite substantial amount of money. They could probably afford, I'm sure the ones here will not be very happy, but I would say they could afford to allow um, accessible data or even zero data to some, um, some uh, households that need them. Um, I think there was affordability payment. Um, I think you asked uh, earlier about packaging which I think is very important for me to answer that as well. We are aware, um, I said I, I was born here, I know uh, how difficult it is to have income in Ethiopia and other parts of um, Africa. So the way we've designed our system is that we've already spent a lot of money uh, with the uh, platform. So that's capital investment. We don't need to recoup that. But we are monetizing the contents we have within reason by doing day pass, uh, AVOD with advertising, um, as well as SVOD, subscription-based and then even free content, because some of the educational material we have are free, because our content owners want to have um, uh, access to that. So at the end of the day, uh, the producers have to be paid, and they are earning money, they've got family to support, and they've got to earn money, so we, you know, not everybody can provide them for free. Um, hopefully that kind of answers quite a lot yes. of the um, questions. And I think that this gives a way for Chris to intervene, because not only content producers, but journalists, if they want to produce reliable news, isn't it, Chris? Certainly. Do you want to add something from your side? If not, I will pass to Carlos. I'll pass to Carlos, it's okay. Okay. Thank you, Giacomo. Carlos uh, Ray Moreno has a couple of uh, comments, and Carlos Afonso has had to leave, but uh, that's fine. So, Carlos, uh, go ahead. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, just to comment on the idea of uh, reducing taxes in exchange of bandwidth, I think many countries have proven that. I think many times uh, bandwidth have been subsidized through universal service access funds to many, many providers. And if something we know by now is that that doesn't work. Uh, many of those projects, when either the funding runs out, the, the, the ISP doesn't have interest, and therefore, you know, if there is a change of law or if there is a change of, of regulation, that doesn't quite work. So what I would encourage is policymakers and regulators to actually be a bit more bold and actually promote other ISPs. I think there is an agreement, the ITU has recognized it recently at WTDC, at the plenipotentiary, in many other forums, even in the Global Symposium for Regulators that uh, Sophie was talking about, that we need to expand. The, 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 op the operators ecosystem, that we need new actors to close the digital divide and to bring meaningful universal connectivity. Else, those providers are going to continue investing in areas where those majority of languages, those majorities of peoples are. So those that are really excluded will continue being excluded regardless of the taxes. Uh, and, and therefore, those new actors need to be, whether for profit or non for profit, whether small ISPs, non for profit community networks, whatever, you name them. But we need to have more actors to cover the needs of those that are not covered by 
the commercial internet. And I'm going to say another resource that we actually submitted for the Global Symposium for Regulators to enable this type of a broader ecosystem of actors to provide connectivity in the countries, in Argentina, in Mexico, in Kenya, in many of the countries where those enablers are taking place, you can see how that's actually happening. So I invite all the policymakers and regulators to do the same. Thank you. Thank you, Carlos. Uh, there was another Carlos asking for the floor. I don't know if he's still connected with us. No, thank no. you, Giacomo, no. for asking. Uh, Carlos Afonso has left, that's okay. So back to you. I think we have to close soon. Um, yes. I don't think there's any other comments from here, but I don't think so. I just wanted to thank all the panelists, if you don't mind, from my side here online. It's been really enriching to hear from all of you. And uh, we hope that the report from the session will also uh, reflect these, uh, not just the cases, the amazing examples, but also the really interesting suggestions and questions that you shared with us. So back to you, Giacomo. Thank you. And if you don't mind, I would give the close to Vint, because he opened, then he contradicted himself, and now probably he can find the synthesis. So first of all, oops, here I listen to myself again. I can tell you this is very mind-boggling. First of all, I really appreciate being here uh, and an opportunity to listen to extremely useful uh, stories about what works and what doesn't work and where the gaps are. Uh, I wanted to re respond to the device cost question by suggesting several possibilities. One of them is driving cost out by design. Another possibility is local manufacturer. Uh, and a third one is subsidy. At least some ISPs uh, and some telcos will offer a device at no charge at all as long as you sign up for a long enough period of, um, of um, a sub, uh, subscription. So there might be several different ways to, uh, to deal with that. With regard to content and language, one thing, that I'm not an expert in this space, but I have learned at Google that our research on machine uh, translation uh, is telling us that when we build a single very large language model that covers multiple languages, that we can sometimes do translation successfully even if we did not have particular language pair samples to drive the translation. So normally you'd think if you had, let's say, 100 different languages, you'd need 100 squared times two different um, networks in order to do the translation in, in uh, each different direction. Lumping it all together into one has a very peculiar and not well understood property of being able to translate languages from one to another where you don't have samples of a particular pair. So that's an exciting thing. Uh, the last point I wanted to suggest, this is gonna sound funny coming from some guy from Google, but we found that advertising drives uh, a lot of usage because we can afford to pay for services from the advertising revenue, and as a result, we can make those services available at very little or no cost. Uh, so one wants to look for other than just two-way business models that will take care of uh, some of the cost and make things available uh, to everyone uh, and making things more affordable. I think the most important thing that can happen as a result of this session is to capture what you've heard and make that available to the leadership panel. It's one of the things that we are eager uh, to get from you is distillation and insight to the problems that are faced around the world uh, in terms of getting meaningful access to the internet and utility from it. So the input that you make for us gives us the opportunity to deliver those insights in venues where parties might not normally have come here. But as they say, if the mountain doesn't come to Mohammed, then Mohammed will go to the mountain. We are not far from where Mohammed was, so uh, it would be easier to go from here than from Mountain Blue <laughs> to go to the Mecca. Um, thank you very much. I think that uh, we have to close. We have even some minutes behind the schedule. Uh, I think it was a very fruitful conversation, but it will be more fruitful if each one of you will continue to do the home duties that we have listened. 
So, for instance, Chris can write to Google asking if they can convey advertising to your local media or <laughs> to, to the <laughs> streaming sector, or if the solution that we have for community networks or for subsidies for devices, etc., could be put in practice in the other fora. We have an international organization working on that. We have government. The IGF is, the beautiful of the IGF is this, and we take for granted what... Uh, Vint promised that uh, if we will send a message to the leadership panel, uh, this will be heard and transferred in the other arena. Thank you very much for your passion. Thank you to Sonia for being with us so, so long and all the people that has attended online and offline. Thank you. <laughs>